Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is part three of four videos today. I've already uploaded the second video. If you haven't watched that, I'll leave it tagged at the end of this video. If you did, then you must be really enjoying this series for you to actually watch them through and through. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hemorrhagic stroke. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button so that you never miss on such content every time I post. Hit the bell notification icon while well, you add it. Drop a comment, drop a like, show some support to Zambia and beyond. Let's jump right in. Remember from our previous videos, we already established that stroke is pretty much a syndrome that's going to be affecting the part of the brain. There is an abrupt onset of non-convulsive focal neurologic deficit that's going to be as a result of interruption of the blood supply. And this is going to be lasting longer than 24 hours. The two main types of stroke, ischemic stroke, which is by far the most common variant, 80 to 90% of the cases are due to this. It may be embolic, thrombotic, or hypoxic. I did cover the details of ischemic stroke in the previous video that I will leave tagged at the end of the video. Then you have hemorrhagic stroke, which is what we're going to be discussing in this lecture, which is going to be accounting for about 10 to 20% in developed countries. But it's actually much higher in developing countries, and this is often attributed to poorly controlled or unrecognized hypertension. This may be in the background of a primary intracranial hemorrhage, which could either be intraparenchymal or intraventricular, or it could be due to extra dural hematoma, subdural hematoma, and subarachnoid hem hemorrhage. But of course, these are topics on their own. So remember that hemorrhagic stroke is by far less common than ischemic stroke, but it's actually much more severe. It usually occurs in elderly patients or middle-aged patients which have severe hypertension. And often these patients are going to present with coma. They may have a headache. They may have vomiting, as well as other symptoms that are very common to stroke, as we discussed with the ischemic type. Mortality occurs in the first week and about 50% of the patients do die in the first week. And remember that hemorrhagic strokes usually occur when a patient is awake and it will be in the background of this patient physically straining or going through some physical activity. And remember this tends to progress within minutes to hours. Causes may be divided as primary intracerebral hemorrhage, which usually is associated with hypertension and sometimes some coagulopathy, or it could be in the background of a subarachnoid hemorrhage where there's a ruptured aneurysm most commonly a circular berry aneurysm. I did show you on the first video the common sites where you have rupture of aneurysms in the circle of Willis. And in addition to this, remember that this is going to be very common in the anterior and posterior communicating arteries, but you can also see this in the middle cerebral artery. You may also see subarachnoid hemorrhage in the background of arteriovenous malformations, vasculitis, and even trauma. Risk factors for berry aneurysms, remember the acronym SHAME, S for smoking, H for hypertension, A for adult polyposis, kidney disease, M for Marfan syndrome, and E for Ella Danlos syndrome, which are collagen disorders. Remember that whatever the case or whatever the cause, there is a rupture of a blood vessel that is happening and there's bleeding into the brain. Remember that it is blood that's accumulating into the brain, which may cause a mass. Sometimes you can begin to dissect through the layers of the brain, dissect through the structures in the brain. It may sometimes even compress adjacent brain tissue. And it's because of these effects that you get this neurological deficit and this neuronal dysfunction. Remember that these large hematoma can actually present with features of increased intracranial pressure and sometimes pressure from the supratentorial hematoma can be accompanied by edema and this can actually cause transtentorial brain herniation and this can actually even compress the brainstem and more or less can actually cause a secondary hemorrhage in the midbrain and the pons and usually this is quite lethal because most patients tend to die. If the hemorrhage actually happens to rupture into the ventricular system, it results in this intraventricular hemorrhage and then this blood can actually accumulate there and this can actually cause acute hydrocephalus. With the cerebellar hematomas, these can actually expand and also block the fourth ventricle because remember the fourth ventricle is within the cerebellum and this can actually cause acute hydrocephalus. It can also result in dissection into the brain stem. Cerebellar hematomas that are actually larger than three centimeters can cause midline shift and herniation. And remember, 
herniation, midbrain, or even pontine hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, acute hydrocephalus, or even a dissection into the brainstem. All these can impair consciousness and have the ability to cause coma. They have the ability to cause death. Clinical features are largely similar to the ones that we get with ischemic stroke, but we do get certain things that are very common to hemorrhagic stroke. So if you have a primary intracerebral hemorrhage, symptoms are going to be likely to be early. Things like levels of consciousness that are going to be depressed. This is quite early. They may have a history of headache. They may have delirium. They may have focal or generalized seizures. They may have nausea and vomiting. And remember that with sudden impairment in the level of consciousness, vomiting with or without headache, this may actually... Uh, lead to a progressive focal neurologic deficit and this actually depends on the site of the bleeding. Headache may be mild or even absent in older individuals and remember that the neurologic deficits are usually sudden uh, and uh, sometimes even progressive and you get these large hemorrhages which can be located in the hemispheres and this can actually cause hemiparesis when actually they are located in the posterior fossa because the cerebellar or the brainstem uh, defects can sometimes be present. For example, you may have this conjugate eye deviation or ophthalmoplegia. Sometimes you may have stertorous bleeding, or actually stertorous breathing. You may also even have pinpoint pupils or sometimes even coma. And with the extradural hemorrhage, remember there's a history of trauma, a severe head trauma, and of course it has a rapid onset of depression at the level of consciousness. While as with a subdural hemorrhage, there is a history of minor trauma in the recent past. It may be some days or even weeks back, and usually this gives you a gradual onset of confusion with or without weakness. With a subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is usually classic on exams because it will give you the sudden history of this severe headache which is described as the worst headache of my life. So it's kind of like a thunderclap headache, like someone has just slapped you on your head. And usually they do have nausea and vomiting with or without decrease in level of consciousness. They may have no rigidity because blood is going to be irritating the meninges. The blood pressure is often elevated and patients are likely to have this focal upper motor neuron lesions and when you do this clinical examination they may or may not have the depressed level of consciousness when you listen to the heart and the carotids you may hear a murmur or a bruit respectively and when you look at the fundus you may see features of papilloedema and hypertensive changes in these patients here's a picture of intracerebral hemorrhage as you can see you have this hyperdense lesion in the cerebrum there with some surrounding edema here you have uh, thalamic as well as a uh, uh, this th thalamic as well as intraventricular hemorrhage to some extent, as you can see, these are the thalami here. Here you have an epidural hemorrhage, here you have a subdural hemorrhage, and here you have a, remember I told you about the supracellar cystin hemorrhage, this is a supracellar cystin hemorrhage, may be seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage. You should be able to identify these things on a CT scan. I do go into details about subdural and subarachnoid hemorrhages when we talk about head injury. So if you've been watched that video, head over there and check out the surgery playlist. Remember that with the large hemorrhages, these are going to be fatal within a few days in about 50% of the patients. In the survivors, actually, consciousness actually will return and the neurologic deficits are gradually going to diminish depending on the various degrees of the extravasated blood that is reabsorbed. Some patients actually have surprisingly very few neurologic deficits because the hemorrhage is actually less destructive to brain tissue than we see with the infarction. Then with the smaller hemorrhages, this can actually cause focal deficits without impairment of consciousness and with minimal or sometimes even no headache or no nausea. And remember that small hemorrhages may actually mimic the ischemic strokes. Now, our management also is divided into general management and specific management. With the general management, it's a similar thing. You admit the patient to the ICU, you do your ABCs because this is an emergency. So you do your airway, you keep the patient's head elevated to prevent any aspiration, give them supplemental oxygen. If the oxygen is less than 94, the saturation is less than 94%, you can give it via face mask or cannulae, keep them optimized with the hydration and nutrition. Fluids generally, we don't want to overhydrate them. We do not want them to be dehydrated, so we give them just enough. If their BP is high, we avoid giving them that. Then, of course, we avoid any glucose because it's neurotoxic, unless if they're hypoglycemic. Then we can push in an NGT if the patient cannot swallow, control the body temperature, and ensure that they are not hypothermic. And you can do this by giving them acetaminophen. So this is pretty much similar to what we did to a patient who had ischemic stroke. The four-hourly to six-hourly bed tanning to prevent ulcers, put a catheter if need be, start physiotherapy as early as possible. You can even start it as early as 48 hours after the event and actually should be continued for the next two to three months. Lifestyle modifications such as improvement in diet and the decrease of salt,
weight control, increase in exercise, cessation of smoking and drinking also should be advised to these patients and they shouldn't drive for at least the first month. And then you reassess them and see if they're able to drive and carry out those normal functions. Now with the specific management, remember that the BP can actually safely be lowered uh, to a systolic blood pressure of about 140 if the BP is actually between 150 to 220. And if the use of acute hypertensive treatment is actually not contraindicated. So if our BP is greater than 220 millimeters of mercury, we want to aggressively drop the BP. We can actually do this by nicotipine, 2.5 milligrams hourly initially, then we increase the dose by 2.5 milligrams every hour. Uh, or per hour every five minutes to a maximum of 15 milligrams per hour as needed to decrease the systolic blood pressure by about 10 to 15 percent remember do not go beyond 15 percent decrease because you're going to be causing more harm than good then the blood pressure control with the uh, antihypertensives you generally want to aim for a systolic blood pressure between 140 to 160 and a diastolic pressure at least that's less than 1110 because this will prevent further bleeding it will prevent other hemorrhagic strokes from happening and remember sometimes you may use hydralazine for example in our setting where we use hydralazine 5 to 10 milligrams iv over 20 minutes if our diastolic blood pressure is greater than 110 if they are Diastolic blood pressure is less than 110. We can actually give them nifedipine 10 to 20 milligrams orally once a day or twice a day. Then cerebral uh, hemisphere hematomas that are actually greater than 3 centimeters and are causing some midline shift or they're causing herniation require surgical consult because they require surgical evacuation. And this is often life-saving for these patients. So early evacuations of these large lobar cerebellar hematomas may actually be life-saving, but sometimes there is a risk of re-bleeding and increasing the neurologic deficits. So the early evacuation of these deep cerebral hematomas is rarely done and rarely indicated because of the surgical mortality, which is quite high, and these neurological deficits are usually quite severe. We may cover these patients also on proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, 20 milligrams orally once a day to prevent these stress ulcers. We may consider nimodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and phenytoin, especially if we suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage as they decrease the risk of vasospasms and seizures in these patients. If the patient is on warfarin, we actually should administer a fresh frozen plasma. And if they have been taking anticoagulants or antiplatelets, give antidotes for this. Remember that anticoagulants and antiplatelets are contraindicated. So if this patient has been using this, we want to reverse the effects as soon as possible. We do this by giving them fresh frozen plasma, we can give them prothrombin complex concentrate, we can give them vitamin K, and in some extents even a platelet transfusion, which is indicated. Hemodialysis can actually be given for the patients that are actually taking dabigatran, and actually 60% of this dabigatran can be removed using hemodialysis. Anti-seizure prophylaxis is not routinely given, and it's only given, we only give them anti-seizure medication if they actually develop a seizure. Then here's a, the table again that I showed you in the previous two lectures so i will leave it on the screen again you may pause the video to actually now compare the information that you learned with ischemic strokes versus the information that you learned with hemorrhagic stroke so you can feel free to pause the video and get a screenshot of this and actually go through it again here is the management algorithm that we were using and you should now be able to understand this management algorithm in its full entirety because we have covered both ischemic strokes also we have also covered hemorrhagic strokes Thank you for spending your time to listen to this lecture on hemorrhagic stroke. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.